Hey, what is going on, Hustle Buddies? Let me know if you guys can see me and hear me and all that jazz. I am super excited for tonight. I want to make sure that everyone uh, got the link for this. So I'm just sending the link back out to the uh, to the Hustle Buddies group. Uh, there's a link there. Awesome. All right. So, yeah, tonight is going to be pretty fantastic. We are bringing in Scott to uh, talk to us about account health. I don't think that I could count the number of times I've seen just the past like 60 days. Because So in Hustle Buddies, um, for those of you who don't know, we have post approval on in Hustle Buddies. So for the most part, an original post shouldn't be spam. That's how we keep out a lot of spam. But anyways, I can't count the number of times we've seen posts try to get approved for like, hey, my account was suspended, or hey, Amazon asked for a plan of action, or hey, I just got an IP claim. Hey, I just got an inauthentic claim. I mean, like every day for like 60 days straight. It's like, all right, Scott, I think we need to bring you back in so we can do a little like intensive uh, account health training type thing to help people with all of these things, especially the hot topics like the IP claims, the inauthentic claims, things like that. Um, like, how do you manage that? How do you avoid it? How do you fight it when it does happen? All of that. Um, so we have got Scott here. Um, Scott, <laughs> he, uh, we've had him on here before. I, and I love that I can say this. He literally at this point has wrote the book on account health uh, for Amazon stuff. We've, we'll be posting a link here. Um, to his book in a second, but he wrote the book on like how to fight uh, Amazon when they send you these things, when they shut down your account, when you get um, IP claims, when they ask for your plan of action for all of these different things. Um, so we brought him on to the group. 
Um, and we've got some pretty cool stuff that we'll talk about here at the end of the call. Um, so if you stick around for that, awesome. But if you're here for just the main event, it's Scott telling us how to fight these stuff. So let's welcome in Scott. Let's see here. Hey, what's up, Scott? How's it going, man? How's it going? Awesome. All <laughs> right. So yeah, we uh, we posted uh, about a week ago that we were going to try to do this if, if there was enough people who were kind of interested. And of course, the post blew up. I mean, people were like, oh, yeah, 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 we need help. We need help. Um, so and a lot of people were posting questions and stuff in there. So um, me and Scott, we're going to talk about some just sort of general best practice stuff and talk about how to deal with things like IP claims and inauthentic claims and all that stuff. Um, and then once we're done with that, Scott, if you're cool with it, I would love to go through some of those like questions that I saw people post, see if we can get any of like the specific ones out. And if you guys have questions here in the live video, like if you're dealing with something specific, post it here in the chat. Maybe help us if you put like a maybe like hashtag question and then write your thing out. It'll be a little bit easier for me to spot while we're going through this. Um, but yeah, I think that would be awesome if we can sort of uh, give people an overview, but then also really dive into the individual stuff. So, so yeah, Scott, take it away. Tell us, tell us a little bit about yourself. Why should we listen to, uh, to you about IP claim stuff? Oh, uh, good question. No, uh, Scott <laughs> Margolius. I have uh, been on Amazon since 2012 and uh, on eBay since 2000, and really have been consulting full-time since 2014. And I, I saw all these needs in the marketplace. You know, I saw everybody struggling with these issues related to seller performance and, and account health, and uh, put out the book uh, about plans of action last year, just because I, I knew that there would be a way to provide a lot of training and help people get over all these hoops. Uh, if they just had a better understanding of what was going on, what Amazon was looking for. So the the book is uh, very helpful in terms of, you know, a comprehensive understanding of what a plan of action should contain and, and what uh, Amazon wants to hear from you. And, and it really puts a lot of power at your fingertips for you to be able to create your own plan. So uh, that was that was the whole intent there, and and a lot of people have really had great results of being able to uh, read the book when they get a performance notification, and um, it's been very successful in terms of people overcoming those problems on their own, without really needing help. I, I also offered to help people, of course, you know, if they need somebody to review their plan of action or edit their plan of action, or if they have specific questions about what to do or Maybe if there's a topic that's not covered in the book, and so I'm very accessible to to help clients with those types of questions, those issues, and uh, it's, everything's been uh, pretty exciting along those lines because it's made it possible for for more sellers to be able to manage those issues in their accounts uh, when that's something that they want to do instead of uh, outsourcing it. Um, overall, what I like to let people know is that you should be paying attention to your account health on a daily basis and part of that means going to your performance notifications on a daily basis and <laughs> for whatever reason i don't know why that that is news to some people when i tell them that <laughs> and, and most people think oh i'm just going to look at the speedometer and forget to uh, check the oil gauge um <laughs> but but really you want to check the uh, performance notifications at least as often as you check your uh, account health dashboard because a, a lot of the information that's in there is, is just super important and, and gives you the detail that you need uh, in order to be able to answer the questions that Amazon's asking of you. In fact, uh, a lot of the time, the issue in the account health dashboard, you'll press on that and it'll take you to the performance notification to read it. But I would suggest reading those proactively. And of course, you know, being on top of your messages and your feedback and your a to Z claims and voice of the customer, all of that on a regular basis um, is, is definitely super important. Yeah, you know, absolutely. Try, try to I, avoid I, having these issues become bigger issues if you're not paying attention to them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's almost sort of like you're um, like if you have a regular job, it, it's almost like those little uh, like, like your boss checks in like all right here's your progress report here's like here's how you're doing and like they bring you to the office like well if you get so many strikes you kind of get fired <laughs> that's that's kind of the deal with amazon like you can make a, a mistake or two sometimes um but you need to fix them because if it becomes a regular thing you're gonna get fired from your job which is amazon yeah um, it's pretty tough because 
Amazon doesn't really tell you how important it is. And there's not a whole lot of training out there. I mean, I provide some training, but other than that, I'm not even aware of any others where they're telling you how critical it is to respond to these performance notifications and giving you any kind of steps in order to be able to do so on your own and tell you what to do. Because it's not obvious. Amazon doesn't tell you what to do. Uh -huh. Amazon doesn't answer these questions. And if you use their messaging system where you're corresponding you know, back and forth with with seller support or account health or whatever, and you ask them a question, you're you're kind of making a mistake there because usually they either can't help you or don't know the answer. Yeah. Well, heck, I mean, even like when Amazon sends you these notifications or send or sends you these um, like account health issues, half the time I feel like they don't even tell you what the root issue is. It's like, they oh, often, here's yeah. here's this random thing. Like you just need to prove that it's I don't know. Here's this IP claim, but like an IP claim could be so many different things. Yeah, <laughs> they just blanket absolutely. it. It's an IP claim. <laughs> yeah, so that's that's very frustrating. It's it's definitely difficult to navigate. Um, so um, with the with the people that like you talk to, that you consult with, that, that ask you questions, things like that. What are some of the most common like issues or questions that people have, and then some solutions to that, or some ways to uh, I don't easily fix that or avoid it in the future, things like that. I'd say one of the most common things that that I see for people who are, especially people who are new or maybe they haven't experienced problems before, is they'll get a complaint that something is inauthentic, and usually that causes uh, you know the seller to be indignant about it. It's like this wasn't inauthentic, this wasn't fake. I didn't <laughs> I didn't source counterfeit goods. Uh -huh. um, and, and, and it's really easy to get focused on that instead of uh, trying to figure out exactly what Amazon is saying, what they're asking of you. And, and you know, so often they don't really give you any clues. It's kind of like you have to understand that there's a need to read between the lines, you know, to determine that a lot of these complaints are that you're being notified about by Amazon are driven by customer complaints. Um, not all of them, but a large majority of them, some some customer complained at some point, and that's why you're receiving this notification. Um, and and a lot of those, uh, they don't tell you where the complaint shows up in your account. You have to dig for it. Uh, I do in the book detail all the different places that you would normally need to go to in order to find the root cause of the complaint. Um, you know the places that you might not be familiar with, or that you might not know where to go in your account that are you know accessible to you but not obvious that those are places you need to go um voice of the customer it's easy to overlook that you know there's nothing mm -hmm. there that's super actionable that you're required to do something but there's good information there i mean it's worth paying attention um going to your your re returns um report and people don't necessarily go there and that's super valuable information and and a lot of the problems that you're notified about can be found there where the buyer left some sort of message as to what was the reason for their return. Yeah, so like you get a lot of people sort of getting frustrated about getting inauthentic claims like, ah, this wasn't inauthentic, like this is real, it's not fake. So what what usually should people be doing then? Like, so they already received the IP claim. They're feeling that frustration. They're feeling that sort of knee jerk reaction of sending Amazon this nasty letter. I sourced this from Walmart. I'm just fine. I can sell this blah, 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 blah. It's not authentic. What should people do instead? <laughs> um, you know, it, it depends on the complaint. Um, okay. I, I think IP complaints of all types are very much different from all the other different types of complaints, all the different types of performance notifications that that need a response and and one one thing that i think is often misunderstood is a lot of these complaints need a response they need you to take action but they don't tell you what action to take and they don't even necessarily tell you that action needs taken they don't they say oh don't worry about it give you a false sense of security that oh this is going to fall off of your account in 180 days and in fact almost all the time it will sometimes it won't um but i i don't think it's as well known that you really want to actually get these removed immediately, get Amazon to remove them from your account health. Don't just wait the 180 days, because if it's sitting there on your account waiting 180 days and they didn't specifically tell you that it's OK, it is often just as bad as if you didn't do anything. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, 
I tend to, and this is just my sort of colloquial experience, but I sort of, I sort of tell people there's sort of a, a rough three strike system. Like if you get one complaint, you're usually okay to, eh. by the time that there's like a third, it's usually like, okay, you, you got to start dealing with these. Um, Cause after a couple, your account's just going to get shut down. So I, sometimes it can be one, sometimes it could be 10, but <laughs> I sort of tentatively say there's sort of a, a loose three strike system. It depends on the age of your account. It depends on the volume mm -hmm. for your account. I was talking to a guy today who has been on the platform since 2007, and he's doing like 300000 a year. I thought he was fine. I didn't think he needed to do anything. He only had one complaint, and you know, I tried to tell him that he didn't have to do anything, but he still wanted to, right? Mm -hmm. So I was like, well, this is approximately what I think that will cost. Um, and in some cases that would be uh that one complaint would be significant for for a new seller um and and then like you said it could be a second complaint it could be a third complaint you don't really know but what i do know is whenever you can get them removed you really want to because you never know when the next complaint's going to come that you can't get removed mm -hmm. and then i mean as a sidebar i mean this isn't necessarily a uh, for Scott necessarily, but and there's a lot of people who are like, man, I want to preemptively try to avoid that. There's really common tools out there for this. I mean, there's things like, um, whoops, that, that's not it. Um, there are things like um, IP alert there. That's, that's what I want to do. Um, there's things like IP alert that you can do where it'll sort of give you a warning and it's just user based. It's just users inputting data like, hey, we got claims for X brand. So you might want to try to avoid that. So you can use things like that. Um, it's not perfectly guaranteed to help avoid every IP claim. Um, and, and again, there's there are ways to fight it. Like, yeah, you can try to avoid it, but also know that it's not the end of the world if you do get an IP claim. So just throwing that out there for people who are wanting to try to avoid things from the uh, from the start. You know, the, the IP complaints, Amazon takes them super seriously and, and they treat them like as if they actually were a real legitimate IP complaint. Mm -hmm. and, and the problem is they very rarely are. And that kind of makes it difficult to fight. Um, in my estimation, there are probably 10 different ways to successfully fight I, IP complaints. Um, but I tend to focus on about two different ways. Uh, one is to get a retraction from the rights owner. Um, and then the other one is uh, you can fight it with a uh, plan of action. There are some people who successfully get them removed just by providing a legitimate invoice or receipt. Um, I would always try that first just because it's the easiest and least expensive before you spend a bunch of time trying to get a hold of the rights owner or spend a bunch of time you know, with the, writing a plan of action. Um, it's, I think, important to note that one of the best things that you can do for the majority of complaints that you would receive in your account health dashboard or in your performance notification, to me, best practice is to close the listing. Don't delete it. Even if you don't want to continue to sell that product, don't want to sell that against that listing again, you don't care about the product, you just want the issue removed from your account, um, close the listing instead of delete it. because. A lot of the time when when someone hires us for, let's say, uh, account health maintenance, you know, they want to hire us on a monthly basis to make these problems go away. They want to outsource and they don't want to deal with it. We can't make nearly as much progress. And it's a whole lot worse of, mm. uh, a, you know, a progress overall and and efficiency and effectiveness if the listings have been deleted. If they've only been closed, that gives us a lot more to work with. And that's the same for you as well. Yeah, and that's, I, I actually have seen that argument where people, um, they'll talk about how deleting a listing entirely can sometimes help, like, prevent IP claims. I don't know what your experience is, Scott. My experience is that if someone really wants to come after you, they can find that information. Even if you have closed, deleted everything, that is, it's still connected to you. There are still ways to find that. And so that's not really a, a barrier of protection. I think it's a little bit of a barrier. Like, I think it's better than, it's better to, 
delete something that you know that you're never going to sell again that you have not received a complaint about. So if it's just okay. sitting there, uh, you know, here's uh, this product that's sitting in my inventory and I'm uh, no longer going to sell it and I don't have any complaints against it, go ahead and delete it. Okay. That, that does give you a layer of protection, I think. Uh, I, I agree with you that they can come back on you, kind of uh, look somehow historically and and get a complaint lodged against you but i think it's less likely and less often mm. okay i don't i don't i know that it happens but i don't see it very much yeah yeah it's definitely not a, a common thing we're kind of talking niche <laughs> experiences now um okay so but that so is yeah, a best get... practice go through go through your especially if you're drop shipping i hope you're not um <laughs> or, or if you're um you know, RAOA, and you've got all these products that you've been selling over a long period of time. You have this giant list of things in your inventory that were sourced a year ago or, you know, a couple of years ago, and you're never going to find them or sell them again. They're not a regular part of your inventory. I would uh, archive them, so to speak, if you can sort of uh, get a copy of all of those things and, and keep, a, keep that as a record in, say, Inventory Lab or something like that, some way where you can keep a record of all those products that you were selling so that you can review them in case you ever mm. wanted to sell them again, but don't use Amazon's managed inventory as your file cabinet. <laughs> sort of thing. All right. Good. To, yeah. Good to note. <laughs> yeah. Get, get all the stuff out of there that you're not going to sell again. Um, and, and that, that would be a protective mechanism to help sort of prevent these things proactively. Okay. Yeah. I like that. All right. Um, so anything else, Scott, any other like common issues or common things? It's like, oh, man, I just wish people would sort of like if this happened, then just do that, uh, that you feel like could really help people. I mean, I would prefer people read the book instead of send in their own plan of action without having read the book, um, <laughs> because a lot of the plans that I see that don't. Uh, sort of follow the structure that I provide, uh, I always end up having to rewrite them or start from scratch. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they're, um, they don't have enough specifics. They don't follow Amazon's format. Even if they have all the information Amazon can, uh, is looking for, uh, Amazon still won't accept them simply because of the fact that they're not in the right format. Uh, I've seen a lot of plans that just kind of drone on and on and on or mm. that uh, don't have enough specifics about what the root cause was or what they've done to fix it or what they're doing to prevent it from happening again. Um, I see all kinds of extraneous information that's not really helpful or relevant um, that doesn't go toward sort of solving the problem. Um, I see all kinds of additional attachments that aren't necessary. Um, things like that, that, okay. I mean, to, to me, you can be, you can be fairly concise. You know, I, I keep most, um, plans to a page or two at the most, even, even if it's a plan for reinstatement, um, most of the time you can express to Amazon everything that they need to know and everything that you've done in, in two pages. Mm -hmm. Um, so Th those are some of the main things. Uh, one other area where I see a lot of questions, a lot of uncertainty gets brought up all the time is um, the difference between invoices and receipts and will Amazon still accept receipts? Um, I think it's a little bit confusing because of the language that Amazon tends to use where they always say that they want invoices. Uh, we, we won't accept that because not an invoice. We require it to be an invoice, blah, blah, blah. Um, they really do prefer invoices, but receipts work just fine. Um, and you can submit a receipt when they ask for an invoice and they'll accept that receipt. The biggest issue is the receipts don't tend to have as much information on them as the invoices. You know, you want to have all of the supplier information and, and you want to have your buyer information and you want to um, draw attention to the ASIN, you know, by circling mm -hmm. it. But what I, what I like to do is I don't like to mark up the original because once you've sort of destroyed the original with anything you might write on there, it makes it harder to use uh, or it makes it less beneficial. Um, one 
rule of thumb, and uh, I do talk about this a little bit in the book, is that uh, I like to make a copy of the original, you know, whether it's a screenshot that you print or whether you take a picture of it on your phone and then print that. Um, I like to take that print off and then mark it up by hand. There are, there are mm -hmm. a lot of people who um, have been either been taught to uh, mark it up graphically on the computer um, or mark, mark it up digitally. And I know that some people do that and get away with it uh, or that Amazon accepts it, but I just don't ever think it's necessary to take that risk. And I've never had a problem doing it manually in the last however long, you know, seven, eight years. Yeah. For, and for those of you guys who like are unfamiliar, I mean, what what I've seen and heard of happening is the Amazon algorithm and the, and the Amazon bots can detect that that file was changed, even though you weren't doing anything malicious. You weren't trying to make something or copy something or write something that wasn't like you're just highlighting stuff just just the fact that you changed the file is detectable by those Amazon bots. And so that's what we're trying to avoid here by making a copy of it, printing it, and then physically uh, writing ASIN, things like that on it. When, um, when so you, yeah, I love when that. You, when you change it in any way digitally, it looks on their end like it's been manipulated or mm -hmm. digitally altered. And you don't want them to make that assumption for any reason because that's a bannable offense. If they mm -hmm. think that you have doctored or fabricated an invoice or a receipt, um, you definitely don't want to do that. Even if you don't have an invoice or a receipt, you still don't want to, you know, fabricate one. Uh, huge mistake. It's just like if you ever had a problem with your Amazon account, you would never say, oh, i am just go open another one because that always makes the <laughs> problems worse. Uh -huh. I, see that, I see that pretty frequently, too. Somebody gets yep. suspended. They can't get it reinstated. They give up and they open another account. The next account gets suspended also because it's a suspected duplicate account. And the only way to fix that is to get the first account reinstated and then go back and get the second account reinstated. Mm -hmm. And then you have to close one of the accounts. And it's a big mess. Uh, I mean, it's possible to resolve that type of situation, but you don't want to be in it. Yeah. Yeah. I love going back just a little bit. I love what you were saying, how like receipts and invoices are basically the same thing. It's just, a, it's a proof of your purchase. The difference is, is the invoice tends to show more data. And so if you can have your receipt show that data or highlight that data uh, in ways that show it, they're just fine. And, and I say this all the time, like I have been doing this for a long time. Scott's been doing this for a long time. There are hundreds of thousands of sellers that have been doing this for a very long time. If receipts were not accepted by Amazon, none of us would have our accounts still because all of us have gotten IP claims. All of us have gotten intellectual property claims. Uh, many of us have gotten kicked off of Amazon for various reasons, and then we're able to come back on and get reinstated. Um, a trick that I personally like to do, um, which I'm glad that Scott sort of worded it the way that he did, um, was I like to also include my own bank statements because that adds an extra sort of layer. Uh, and and now it's Scott, like you're you're the expert on this. So I'll defer to you. And if you hear me do something, it's like, eh, that's not quite right. So let me know. But something I like doing is actually um, printing out my bank statement and highlighting uh, like my name and information on the bank statement, then highlighting the purchase information of the purchase. Like, let's say I get something from Walmart. I can highlight that Walmart purchase. And then on the receipt, I can highlight, uh, the receipt will show like the last three or last four digits of your credit card that you used. I'll highlight that and then point that back to here is my, like, okay, last four numbers, one, two, three. Here is my account, blah, 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 one, two, three. It's connected to Nate Jackson living at one, two, three Main Street. And here is this purchase from Walmart. And so it, it adds that that proof that, okay, my supplier is Walmart from this address. Here's their phone number. Here's their email. You can contact them here. And here is my info. I was the receiver of these goods. Here's my address. Here's my information. Here's all. And so it just adds that extra little level of connectivity with everything, along with writing the ASIN and all of that. Um, so that's something that I like to do on my on my IP claims and things. I mean, I've never done that. I've never really encouraged somebody to do that. Okay. But I can see the benefit of doing it, especially if you have buyers. If you, if you are not which, the one, which we do. Yeah. That was yeah. an issue for us. <laughs> if, if you're not the one who's buying that thing for your account and it's got your name on the credit card and the last four digits that can easily be tied to you. And you've got to sort of explain, well, where did this come from and who's this person who's not on my mm -hmm. account? Then what you're saying does make a lot of sense. 
Awesome. All right. So I'm not crazy. I might be going a little overboard, but I'm not crazy. (laughs) Uh, and, and And that's a good way to clear it up. All right. Love it. Awesome. Okay. So we've covered a lot of the basics. I want to make sure that we have time for some of this Q and A stuff. Um, so let me see if I can pull up. I made a post about this um, a couple days ago. Shoot, man, Facebook makes it so hard to find past posts. Um, I'll just keep talking while you're looking for that. Go for it. <laughs> um, you know, one thing with the IP complaints and getting a hold of the rights owner is um, a lot of the time somebody will hire us to help them with the IP complaint. And we'll end up doing a lot of the types of things that you could do on your own that you don't need to pay somebody to help you do unless you just don't want to do it. Right. There are a lot of people that's like, oh, I don't feel like messing with this, which I totally understand. Um, but if you want to save yourself some time, trouble, money, um, you could do that on your own by contacting the rights owner and and reaching out to them, getting a hold of them and being super, I would say, pleasantly persistent. Right. You want to reach out to them. You don't necessarily want to, you know, uh, I don't know, drive them nuts. Um, but sometimes they don't reply. Right. So there may be other ways to contact them besides just the method that was provided by Amazon that yes. was provided by the complainant when they uh, lodged that complaint. So it's like you could find their phone number, you could look them up on LinkedIn, you could look them up on Facebook, you could see what company they belong to, you could look up other people in their organization and say, hey, I'm having trouble getting a hold of Nate, is is there a way you could give me his uh, phone number or his email address or uh, give me his extension or anything like that? I mean, you, you want to get a hold of them in a, and, and have a positive interaction um, because it's super important and, and super helpful and one of the fastest, easiest, least expensive ways to get that IP complaint removed from your account mm-hmm. if you can get them to retract the complaint. And um, Fab Four says like, well, what if they don't respond? Well, that's then you go on to writing your plan of action and all of that. So this that's just step one. That's like, if you can get them to retract it, perfect, easy, piece of cake. You don't have to do anything else. If you can't, then everything else that this call is about is what, is what we're talking about. It's writing your plan of actions. It's talking to Amazon. It's going through Amazon's channels to deal with that IP claim or inauthentic or whatever kind of issue you're having. Just don't give up too easily. There, I see, I see people give up too soon. Mm. It's like, oh, I haven't heard back from them, so they throw up their hands. You know, um, that's that's not the right approach, really. You you want to really dig in you know, pretend that you're trying to get a scholarship for your kid, you know, and you've got to get a hold of somebody in the academic department so that you can get a hold of somebody in the athletic department so that you can get a call returned or whatever. I mean, it's uh, pretend that you're going to bat for a family member who's got health issues and and you've got to get the right information from the right doctor or whatever. Um, It's just super important to to not give up just because you don't hear something. Oh, I tried, but didn't hear anything back. Well, sometimes that may happen and you may might not hear anything back at all, but just sending a few few emails in my mind is not sufficient. Yeah. All right, um, I was able to find that post finally. So there's a couple great questions. Maybe we can touch on a couple of these. Um, all right, so there's a person on Facebook saying, have you noticed anything change i'm paraphrasing a little bit to shorten it but have you noticed anything change recently with them accepting receipts this person said traditionally like they've always been fine but the past week or two it seems like they're rejecting every single thing that they're using a receipt for um or are there i don't know i guess are there ways to help a receipt be accepted more frequently to, to me, the best way is to take a picture of it, print it off. So now your receipt is on an eight and a half by 11 sheet. And it makes it super easy for you to find the product on the receipt, circle that item, and then hand write ASIN and then B00 whatever, right, right next to it. Um, and then it's helpful to circle the supplier information uh, on the receipt. And sometimes that's about as good as you can get. Uh, because you won't be able to have the rest of the information that Amazon could verify as if it was an invoice. 
but those things are usually uh, enough to make that receipt m maybe more acceptable. You got to remember how they they have this come in front of them, you know, the person in uh, seller performance, and they have very little time to review this case. So the easier easier you make it to find the important information that they need to verify, the better. Um, another thing that uh, is helpful when you're dealing with uh, submitting receipts, invoices, uh, and and plans of action is um, calling and getting a hold of account health. Um, because sometimes I've found that, okay, I'll, I'll help somebody with their plan of action draft and they're not getting anywhere, they're not getting a positive response. And, and we're able to find out that they either didn't receive the receipt or the, the plan of action was received, but the receipt was not, or the mm. receipt was received, but the plan of action was rejected. And mm. you can you can talk to somebody in account health and and get that kind of information when you're able to say, you know, can you give me any uh, insight as to what is going on with my my appeal for this ASIN? Uh, uh, you know, I heard back and they're looking for more information, but I provided all the information they were looking for. Would you mind reviewing it for me? And and can you verify that my uh, receipt was or invoice was received and and accepted and applied? Can you tell me what's missing here? And uh, and often that they can they can provide some uh, valuable information. Just remember that they want to be helpful. They're trying to be helpful. They're there to be helpful, but that doesn't mean that they're helpful. Uh, <laughs> they either might not know what they're talking about, or you might get somebody who's just not very good. And so you always want to take what they're telling you with a grain of salt. And if you for some reason can't understand them or don't think that they're giving you good information, let them know very you know pleasantly that hey I, oh boy i've got to run for now and then just call back and get a different rep uh, <laughs> uh -huh. yep and you could try different times of day as well so yes. you know if you keep getting uh if your plan of action keeps getting rejected and you're don't just keep sending the same thing over and over and you've got to do something to make it different and better uh before you send it again um, if I were you and you haven't done this very much on your own, you're not real confident about what you're doing, by the time you get to the second or third rejection, you probably need to hire somebody for at least the first time um, to, to make sure that you don't end up sort of flying the plane into the ground. Um, because it is definitely possible to be um, successful with the broad majority of these complaints. And in some cases, it's like you just need to get a little bit of confidence under your belt to know what's possible and to know how subtle the differences are that make a failed attempt uh, to be in a position where it can be successful. Um, to me, it's it's like, let's pretend we see a brand new type of complaint for, for some uh, product or category, and we have all these people who are getting uh, notifications for a specific uh, new brand, let's say. I like to wait a little bit and, and let the dust settle and and see what it took for somebody to be successful uh, instead of just diving in and sending a response and getting rejected like everybody else. Um, and sometimes that can be helpful. Um, it, but it's to me a great confidence builder just to know that there is a way to solve the puddle, a puzzle. There is a, a almost a riddle sometimes and the riddle can be resolved don't just give up or assume that that it's not fixable simply because you mm -hmm. couldn't fix it it, it yes it doesn't mean it's uh -huh. not fixable. yeah i see that a lot a person who just tries and can't fix it yeah um, yeah so you know oh amazon won't accept receipts because they didn't accept my receipt and they didn't accept my plan well exactly. no exactly yeah, and that's where those rumors start, where it's like, oh, Amazon is no longer accepting receipts. No, they just denied this one person's receipt who then talked about their story. And now everyone believes that and is sort of spreading this. Yeah. Oh, there's this new changes coming down. It just doesn't work like that. <laughs> you definitely don't want to take your own singular experience as gospel that mm -hmm. is transferable to or transmissible or whatever to everybody else. <laughs> yes. All right. People are solving these things, right? Exactly. So these, yep. are, these are problems that are solvable. Mm -hmm. Just like most other problems in your business. You know, yep. you're beating your head up and beating your head against the wall over this issue over here with your accounting or bookkeeping and this issue over here with your staff and this, this issue over here with your sourcing and all those are solvable problems.
yep. every single thing that you'll encounter. And so this is just one more of those things. And, and you've got to determine pretty quickly, uh, you know, as a business owner who happens to be selling on Amazon, you're in charge, right? It's like you've got to figure out who's responsible on to, to manage all these things, to engage in all these activities on a daily basis. And at some point when you reach a certain size and you can afford to hire other people, um, you've got to determine is it the best use of your time to be fighting these complaints in your account health. And, and if it's not you, you either need somebody in your organization to do it who's skilled at that kind of thing, or you need to hire it out. Uh, and, and hopefully in the meantime, it's possible, and I'll tell you, it is possible to avoid a lot of these complaints. I see a lot of accounts They've never had any of these complaints ever in their entire selling career. And all of a sudden, <laughs> this one guy who started selling in 2007 that I talked to today, he's super frustrated because he got this complaint that he's never had before. He's never had to deal with it, right? Uh -huh. It's like, here he was, Mary, Mary, Mary selling, sailing <laughs> along for the past however long that is, uh, and, and gets hit upside the head by a complaint that he wasn't expecting and doesn't know what to do with it, right? So you gotta you got to realize that there are some people who don't have to deal with those types of things. And so a lot of the time, if I see a lot of complaints on somebody's account, um, that's an aberration. There's a reason for that. There's a cause. There's some kind of pattern that's causing that. And a lot of the time, it could be what you're sourcing, where you're sourcing, how you're sourcing, how you're packaging. A lot of, uh, like I said, a lot of those types of problems are driven by customer complaint. Um, and a lot of it is driven by the condition uh, issues. Maybe if you're, you know, sourcing from an off-price store or whatever, you got to remember if you're going to, um, oh, you know, like a, a outlet store. A lot of the products mm. in the outlet store are not first quality. So, mm -hmm. um, Amazon customers are so finicky, so sensitive, so specific that they'll notice if it's some cheap knockoff version that's an actual product from the actual brand that the brand put out as a cheap piece of junk and sold it to their <laughs> outlet store because that's the only way they could liquidate it. Uh-huh. Yep. And there will be things, I mean, especially for those of us who do a lot of clothing, I mean, if you've been in the outlet stores a lot with a lot of clothing, you'll you'll start to notice there are even some clothing that will have a separate tag um, that is for these things. It's like the seconds, it's the, the mistake things, like, oh, this inseam isn't right, or this is actually a, like one leg is 35, and the other leg is 34. Like, they'll have a, they'll have a marking on it, um, and you'll start to notice that and, and see how to avoid that. So, um, yeah, avoiding that stuff, I would say, is, is huge. Um, using tools, things, again, um, I'll put a link here again, like uh, IP Alert, for example, is, is really easy um, to use. I know a, a ton of people who use that. Um, I tell people avoid selling a brand, uh, avoid selling an item if the brand itself is also selling it. Um, I mean, that's just sort of a recipe. I know Scott said a lot of these things come from customers, but what will often happen if the brand themselves is selling it, they have no reason to try to share the buy box with you. And so they're going to sort of do some of these black hat tactics. They're going to pretend to be a customer. They're going to buy your products. Then they're going to complain to Amazon about you, about this product. Uh, they'll slash your product up. I mean, I've had all sorts of things happen to me when I was first starting and I didn't know this. Um, so avoid things with a brand on the product. Um, avoid these like discount liquidation type stores. I tell people, if you can't prove that it's new on Amazon, it's not new. Uh, this whole deal with like, oh, they don't accept receipts. If your receipt is itemized, you're good to go. If you're buying something and your receipt says like men's shoe, $300, okay, that's not that's not a receipt that's going to work for you. How does Amazon know men's shoe for $300 is this new pair of Nike Jordans or whatever? Like, So you, you have to be able to prove that it's new, not just think that it's new, but you have to be able to prove that it's new. Um, so yeah. those are the, some of the uh, some of the ways to avoid it. That does bring up a couple of things. Uh, one, it's important to keep in mind that all not all receipts are the same. So mm -hmm. Amazon does accept receipts, but it's a lot more challenging to um, prove that your product is new, real and genuine when you got it from TJ Maxx, Marshall or Ross. Now, there are a lot of uh, people who do that and they're just fine and their tactics and strategies that they use and you can be in special groups that, you know, have lists that they put out. 
Uh, and they'll also provide training about, you know, how to prove those things using your Ross, TJ Maxx, Wal- mm-hmm. uh, or Marshall's receipt. But if you don't have those tactics and strategies, those might not be the best places to source unless you know how to do that. Uh, and and I would even put things into like three different tiers. There's normal itemized receipts, like Walmart is an example, normal itemized. It has all the information. There's stuff like TJ Maxx, Ross, and all of that, which they're not perfect but they're doable you can still connect it because there are still identifying numbers on the receipt that identify that product and there are ways to connect that to the item and then there are garbage receipts this is your like liquidation stores where like there is nothing on this receipt (laughs) there's no identifying anything it doesn't say their address doesn't say your address doesn't show any numbers with the product though that last category that's garbage don't source these secondhand stores don't source liquidation um if you're going to Goodwill to buy used books, all right, used books, that's, I would say that's generally a pretty safe place to buy stuff from for used books. But don't be like, oh, hey, look, there's a brand new KitchenAid in box. Let me buy this from Goodwill and sell it on Amazon as brand new. That's that's stupid. <laughs> you can't do that. I would say for any niche, for any niche product, any niche category, you want to learn about as, uh, as much about it as possible. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so let's say you're selling books. You want to be in some uh, book selling groups so you can learn everything there is to know about books. Or if you're selling mm-hmm. shoes, you want to be in some shoe selling groups so you can learn everything there is to know about shoes because every category is different. And they all and, have the nuances. Know, you could be an expert in, uh, you know, clothing. You could be an expert expert in outdoors but that does not equate to all the other categories right and it's like you get in start selling books when only you've only been selling shoes and it's just an entirely different world um so you don't want to assume that oh amazon is amazon is amazon and all the knowledge that you have will translate if you're getting into a new category um another thing you mentioned is don't sell products where the brand is also selling it and that reminds me don't sell anything where the product that you have in hand, that brand, is not an exact match for the product detail page. If there's any difference whatsoever, um, well, I, I see this all the time. I don't even know how to pronounce this. Like noon? Okay. Uh-huh. Uh, sure. Let's say I sourced <laughs> this, right? I, I bought 12 of these because they were a pretty good price, uh-huh. right? And they're all in date, you know, no problem whatsoever. These are... 2023 so i could sell this as a three pack or a four pack or whatever um but the problem is if you come across a listing for this product and the brand says by noon or it says new and N- u space un or anything different than the actual brand that's a problem somebody's mm-hmm. created that or or, the, or something that's nothing like that you know it says oh the the energy drink company or whatever, and yep. they're selling that product under that ASIN. Man, I've Stay seen that with it. Nike where they replace like the I with a lowercase L. So it looks like Nike, but it's actually like Nike. <laughs> but it looks exactly, it still looks like N-I-K-E, but it's not. So uh, yeah. It's... There's several things that people are doing to, or, to get away with or that or to get around Amazon's listing restrictions or whatever. And one is so that you can create a new listing and set whatever price you want because the original listing for that specific UPC, that specific product, they, you know, it's got too much competition or the price has been beaten down yep. or whatever. So you create a new one because you know there's high demand for it. Somebody to sell it. I mean, uh, find it and you'll be able to sell it for a much better price. And then you got a whole nother series of people who are like, they've brand registered their cheesy fake brand <laughs> uh-huh. uh, and and they're kicking everybody off this listing for that noon product and what they've done is they've added a sticker or a you know a poster or a coaster or something ridiculous and stupid along with it to make it their own product their own listing and then when you list on it they're, you're going to get hit upside the head with an ip complaint yep all right so I want to try to be mindful of people's time because I know people have jobs and kids and things like that. We've There's a couple more Q&A questions um, that I want to get through. I'll see. I'm going to go through a couple of these. If I feel like I can quickly answer it, I'll try to spitfire it. Uh, if not, I will defer to you, Scott. And let's let's just try to crank through a couple of these rapid fire. Um, and then we can talk about the, uh, the cool uh, 
template thing we've got going on here. All right, so Brenda on Facebook was asking about dealing with pesticide claims on clothing, um, since you can't change the listing. Uh, if I'm understanding you correctly, Brenda, where it says like you can't list this because it's a pesticide, just take your pesticide training. It says it's a pesticide because it's antifungal. So like Nike socks and Under Armour socks, for example, are antifungal, which technically that wording is what Amazon is using to say that it is a pesticide. Um, so if you take your pesticide training, then it doesn't matter what Amazon is saying because you're allowed to sell things that have pesticides in them and it doesn't affect the listing. Um, let's see. Do, do, do. Well, a lot of the time you can change the listing. You can remove the offending words whatever it was, whatever keyword that the Amazon bots caught on to, mm -hmm. you can you can update the listing and remove the thing that they found that was objectionable that caused it to be considered a pesticide. But that yes. goes back to what I said at the beginning, you can't do that if you've deleted the listing. You can mm -hmm. only do it if you've, if you've closed the listing, then you still have the ability to edit. But if you've deleted the listing, you can no longer edit that. Yep. And some listings can be a little bit harder to do that with. That's definitely possible. So first I would say, um, first, get the pesticide training. It'll be okay to do that. Second, try to edit the listing natively within the Amazon thing. If that doesn't take, if they're like, oh, you can't do this, you're not the brand owner, try to use a flat file to do it because sometimes that can sort of brute force it through. If you're not aware, if you don't know about flat files, you can do a group search. Uh, we've talked about some flat file uh, updating stuff before, especially Brenda, I think you're in some of our other things like the insiders and the replan workshop. There's a lot more talk about that in there. And sometimes uh, the flat file won't work. You know, you've got to uh -huh. open a case, you've got to get a hold of a yes. representative, you've got to, you know, get somebody in a catalog team or category yeah, team. Yeah, catalog team is, is a good keyword to ask for when you're talking to support. Like, I want someone from the catalog team. Reach me to the catalog team. You yep. got to get them to change it for you when, when the flat file won't work. Yes. Um, all right, so do, do, do. I'm trying to just quickly go through some of these. Uh, account deactivation seems to occur on a whim. Is it on a whim, or is there really something that sellers are doing that makes this happen? <laughs> what do you think, Scott? Um, 90. Five to ninety-nine percent of the time, the seller did something wrong, either intentionally or unintentionally. There's something that they didn't do, or something that they needed to do that they didn't do, um, or that they did incorrectly, or didn't respond mm -hmm. to performance notifications. There's there's usually a reason. It's not it's not like you're just walking down the street and get hit in the head. Yeah. Um, all right, so I see some other people saying like, okay, I've been, and I saw a couple similar questions. So again, I'm paraphrasing, but it's like they got maybe three different claims for the same brand or something like that. And they were successful on two of them, but the third one just won't take, just won't stick. Um, my opinion on that is there's different eyeballs that are looking at each of your claims and different people are saying yes and different people are saying no. Um, so in my opinion, you can probably resubmit things. Scott, do you have any better wisdom than that? I mean, I I always get a lot of confidence from a situation like that, knowing that there were some that were removed, mm -hmm. right? If the, if those were removable, that, that tells me that there's a very good chance that this other one is removable and there's no logical reason why it hasn't been. And so it's mm -hmm. a matter of taking another run at it with different language, submitting it at a different time of day, you know, continuing to be persistent mm -hmm. with calling account health. I mean, it's a matter of knowing that it's removable and not giving up. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Um, Bryant on Facebook said, if you do wholesale, do you still need to worry about IP claims? Yes, this is a really common misconception that only arbitrage sellers deal with IP complaints and inauthentic complaints and all that. Everyone deals with this. I mean, heck, even private label sellers deal with this. Everybody deals with it. It doesn't, you can even have permission from the brand. I've, I've heard of this exact situation. Uh, person had a deal with the brand directly, we're buying from the brand. Some employment changed within the brand. So now the person in charge of that changed. They didn't know and they sent out all these IP claims to everybody. And then when the seller was like, hey, we had this deal with you guys, like I got permission. They're like, oh no, we're no longer okay with that. So like they completely reneged on their whole sort of deal that they had going on. So yes, uh, wholesale does not protect you from this. Uh, I mean, it might happen less often because you have less different types of things, but um, yeah, 
if you're but slightly again, like, more protected, you know, at yeah, least yeah, yeah. in most cases you have a little bit of a relationship with the brand. Mm-hmm. Um, I, kn- I knew somebody who was a master distributor for, for a specific brand. Um, they, they still kicked him off. In fact, they filed like 88 IP complaints against him. Um, and he was able to get him removed, but you don't want to have to deal with that. But just being wholesale didn't protect him. You know, if you have a, an authorization letter, that's a little different. Uh, uh-huh. and that can be super beneficial. Um, but I've also heard of a situation where uh, I was, a client had permission from uh, just directly from the uh, distributor, but there were four distributors, right? Mm-hmm. They cover the whole United States. So he had permission from these guys on the East Coast, but the people on the West Coast didn't want him selling it. And it's just like, ugh, what a mess. Yep. Yeah, I love you're, it. You're certainly better off to have a relationship with the brand owner, with the manufacturer. With oh, the absolutely. Supplier. You know, that's. that's yeah, I, I don't want to take away from that at all. There's, there's absolutely some, some, uh, a massive extra layer of security when you're, when you have that uh, relationship, when you have like the wholesale client, all that stuff. But just the preemptive, like it doesn't completely stop everything. Is sort of what I was trying to yeah. make sure people understood. Um, you already answered this on the Facebook post, but I'm going to share it here for the people watching. Lisa was saying, when should you take it to the next level? At what point do you hire a lawyer or hire someone to help? And your answer is perfect. One, when you can afford it. And two, when you can't afford not to. And that is absolutely perfect. I love that because people are like, okay, well, I'm dealing with my own things. I've like Some of my plan of actions are being accepted. Some of them aren't should I hire someone to help? People are expensive. Like, well, for me in my business, like I run a seven figure business. This is my full-time income. Why would I not spend that money to have an expert do this for me and deal with it for me? Why would I ever touch that? Like I can't afford for this to shut down my account. um, And I can afford to hire it out. So for me, that's a no brainer. I mean, in the UK, a lot of people do their own dental work. Uh, or so I've heard, but you can tell, right? If, if, if you, you can tell that they do their own dental work. If you can afford to hire a dentist, why wouldn't you? Really? Um, this is probably going to be too long of a subject. I don't know if you can just briefly touch on uh, counter DMCA. I've never stuff. called one. How about that? All right. I think I think that it can be beneficial to file one, but I've never filed one myself and I've never encouraged somebody to do so because of the potential of there being a counterclaim that, you know, you can't defend. Yeah. And so unless you are a thousand percent certain that you're in the right, I wouldn't do that. Yeah, and it's basic the the DMCA is basically like it you're telling Amazon, listen, um, they need to sue us and tell us what they are suing us for. Or this has to stop. That's, I mean, I'm sort of <laughs> I'm really watering it down, but that's sort of what it's saying. Um, and so, yeah, you need to be a thousand percent sure, because if you're not, they're going to, to sue you. <laughs> it could be a super effective strategy. Um, if you're going to use that strategy, I'd make sure you have enough money to be able to hire a lawyer in case you need to. Yes. Yeah, that is a very good rule of thumb. Um. Yeah, just a lot of people asking about like email, or I'm mean, sorry, invoice versus receipts. We already touched on that a fair bit. As long as your receipt has all the information, everything is, is highlighted, highlight it physically, uh, make physically, sure you're including. With, with the highlighter. Mm-hmm. And, and so when we say highlight it, like we're talking like write the ASIN, highlight the, the business's address, their contact info, highlight your information so it's clear that you are the buyer here and they are the seller. Um, All of that stuff needs to be highlighted. And I tell people, like, imagine that a third grader has 10 seconds to approve or deny this receipt. That's sort of what we're dealing with most of the time here. Uh, At least that's my assumption. When I'm dealing with seller support, I assume that I'm talking to a third grader or chatting with a third grader who has 10 seconds to deal with my issue. Uh, Let's see. A couple people. So Sheena... I've uh, been trying to fight a claim. I've submitted my POA three times with no luck. So yeah, and that's sort of what we're talking about. Once once you sort of submit it a couple times, it, it gets harder when you consecutively don't fix it. 
it gets harder and harder each time to actually fix it. So I, I think Scott said like two or three times, maybe on your own and then try to hire it out. I think that's a good uh, general rule of thumb. Um, so yeah, let me see here in the chat. I All just right, took an invoice. invoice. Yeah. It took me like 10 seconds to grab an invoice, highlight it, circle it, and write the ASIN. And so I don't know if you can see that, but uh -huh. I mean, that's what we're talking about. That's yep. that, that fast, that simple. Like, it, don't avoid it. It's not arduous. Uh huh. I've even heard, I don't know if you've ever seen this or experienced it, but I heard a funny, again, it's sort of a hearsay colloquial story, but uh, of somebody who every time they submit their invoice or receipt, they submit it upside down, just so the person actually has to look at it and read it. <laughs> well, it's less likely to get rejected by a bot that way. I wouldn't, yes. do it, I wouldn't necessarily do that that way every time. But I would do it that way on a second occasion if you're submitting it and it was rejected automatically the first time without reason. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, I'll try to maybe do two more questions from here in the live chat. Um, and then I'm going to talk about some uh, plan of action help that you can help people with now if people are interested in that. And a pretty sweet deal we've got for Hustle Buddies. Um, all right, so this Facebook user said, how do you handle, let me see if I can show this. Um, how do you handle when there is a product recall and it shows up as a violation? What are some strategies for that? This is something a little bit more uncommon, but possibly might be able to touch a little bit on this. Sure, so usually that's gonna require a plan of action. Uh, first thing I would do is close the listing. Um, then make sure you don't have any other inventory. I recall all that inventory. Um, make sure you read the initial uh, notice as to why the product was recalled. And then one of the things I often tell Amazon that I'm doing and put this in the plan of action is um, going to all of the government websites that allow you to proactively keep track of all of those consumer product safety warnings, you know, whether that's whoever's putting it out for that particular type of product, whether it's uh, CSPI or whatever it is, Consumer Product Safety Commission, or whether it's, uh, you know, FDA. Um, and there are a couple other sites that you can subscribe to where they'll send out alerts so that, you know, it's the kind of thing you see hanging up on the bulletin board in the back wall at Walmart. Um, and, and they'll have these bulletins for recalls. Um, so you want to let them know that you're being proactive about that. And, um, you can let them know that you're you're checking in advance to make sure that these products that you're sourcing don't have any uh, recalls or alerts before you send them into Amazon and that you uh, actively check your messages and alerts that you've signed up for as, as a subscription basis to make sure that you're um, being, you know, keeping aware of all those different possibilities at all the, all the time and scouring your other inventory. Make sure you told them uh, you've looked at all the rest of your inventory to make sure you don't have any other types of products that might be in violation. Mm -hmm. Love it. All right. And we'll have this as the last question because it is so common. I mean, We see this probably every other day. And I'm curious to get your take on it because I have a very strong take on one side of the argument. But I'm open to other sides if you disagree with me. So. Debbie here from YouTube says, how do you handle letters from companies that they send to your house saying like, stop selling our product or where did you buy this from? Uh, wanting to know all of that details. Do you send them information? Do you, do you tell them where you bought it from? Do you say that you'll stop selling it? Do you do all that stuff? I'll give you my answer while Scott thinks about this for a second. Here's what I, I do. I, I take the letter, <laughs> I rip it up, I light it on fire and I throw it in the trash and it keeps selling. A lot of people do that. You know, a lot of people do that. They say the, the immediate response is, you know, tell them to pound sand, you know, unless there's some kind of specific legal action. Mm -hmm. um, I tend to fall on the conservative side and say, you know, if this looks pretty legitimate and they went to that much trouble to get a hold of you and it, you know, obviously could be a scare tactic and it could be from a competitor. You want to evaluate all of that. But at the same time, it's like, hey, the most important thing you have here is your Amazon account. You know, this is your golden goose and and if this is just one golden egg that you're dealing with that's not worth risking sacrificing your entire account in order to keep selling that one so i, I hesitate on something like this and i don't <laughs> mind providing my information i don't mind providing where it came from and that kind of thing i, I don't see any risk in that if, especially if it's 
uh, inquiry from a legitimate uh, source, and uh, I don't have anything to hide. So you know, you sourced it all legitimately, and and it shouldn't it shouldn't be an issue. And and the bottom line is, you might not be able to continue to sell it, but mm-hmm. this is the precursor to that anyway. You might as well uh, get in compliance as quickly as possible so that it doesn't become an issue on your account. Um, I recognize that there are a lot of people who wouldn't agree with that and they just completely ignore it. And <laughs> it's all up to you in terms of your level of risk. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think, I mean, I agree with, with pretty much everything there. I think it comes down to like, is it worth the fight for you? So like an example for me, if I'm trying to sell, I don't know, this Addison and Gates shea butter lotion, like maybe I have one in stock. Is that worth a battle? Like, is that worth me trying to fight? No, just get off the listing. Bring it yeah, home and then it. use it on your legs. All right. Yeah. But sure. something like Jansport, again, personal example, I sold a lot. I sell a lot of Jansport. I mean, over a quarter of a million dollars of just Jansport backpacks. And Jansport will pop up on every IP claim alert, everything. It's like, oh, it's high risk, whatever. Um, they've sent me so many letters. Do I ignore it every single time? Yes, because it's. It is so valuable to me. If they want to fight me over this, it is worth enough money for me to hire a lawyer and fight them, A, because I know I'm going to win, um, and B, because it, it's making me so much money. Like, I don't mind taking the risk there. Um, so that's sort of where I'm at with uh, with those letters. If it's, if it's not worth your time, if you only have one or two in stock, all right, yeah, just get out of it and move on. Don't put up a fight. But if, if it's one of like a huge replant for you or a huge brand you're selling a lot of, Maybe maybe consider fighting that a little bit. I mean, the truth is they don't have a legitimate reason to kick you off the listing. You know, first exactly. sale doctrine says that you can sell that product unless there's some sort of specific reason why you can't, like a warranty issue, something like that. Otherwise, you have every right in the world to do so. And they're just trying to engage in either, you know, anti-competitive behavior or selective distribution, trying to kick you off the listing. And if it's important to your sales and important, you know, aspect of what you're doing financially, then it might be worth fighting for. Um, If it's small potatoes, don't waste your time and move on. Exactly. All right. So finally, before we jump off the call here, we we made something super cool for you guys. So people ask about this all the time, need help writing POAs, I need help with this, need help with that. But I feel like there's a gap because there's a lot of times where it's like, yeah, try to write this yourself. And then if you can't write it yourself, hire a professional. Well, sometimes professionals can cost a lot. I mean, you can hire Scott. He's, I mean, he's not the most expensive, but he's also not the cheapest person. Um, it's going to cost you a fair amount to have someone, to have a professional look at your plan of action, to edit it, to change it, all of that stuff. If that's what you want to do, then great. But I think that there's these these sort of people in the middle where it's like, well, it, I don't quite have that much money, but I also really need help writing these plan of actions. So we've, uh, Scott has put together a ton of different plan of action templates. And I'll use that word very loosely because these are not things that you should be copying and pasting. These are examples like this is what Amazon wants in this situation. These are the things they're looking for in that situation. Here are some examples. Don't copy and paste it because copying, pasting will often get rejected by the Amazon bots. So rewrite these in your own words, but base it off of this. You can sort of like loosely plagiarize (laughs) the templates. Don't word for word copy and paste, um, but rewrite it include everything that Scott's sort of pointing out. So um, Scott put this together. There's like, there's like, what, 29, 29 I think, 30, t- yeah. 30 templates, something. I mean, it's every All situation. I mean, issues. I saw people asking, I mean, there's other comments too that I've seen people asking about like the pesticide thing. There's one for like California. There's some funky stuff with California rules. Um, there's, I mean, even like the people who are like drop shipping, but they're trying to change. They reformed, they, they've repented of their dirty ways, but they're trying to get this drop shipping claim. There's even drop shipping stuff on there. Like, here's how you get rid of those things. Um, so a ton of different templates. And then because you know how we roll with house buddies, we always try to sort of make you guys a deal. Um, we've put together a coupon. So it's actually for just the people on this call. I'm not going to like advertise this elsewhere, but if for the 91 people who stuck around for this call, um, uh, the hustle buddies are, we're putting in a hundred bucks off of this. So make sure when you're in the checkout thing, 
Um, it's usually like 250. We knocked 100 bucks off of that. It's almost half off, so it'll be 150 roughly. Or it's like 140 something um, for you guys. So we knocked 100 bucks off for the people who are on this call. It's sort of a, a way to say thanks to the hustle buddies for joining this call, for asking the questions, for participating, um, and all that. Scott, do you have anything to add to that? I would say it's don't buy this by itself. Like it's really important that you get the book, right? Yes. You, you, want, you want the core concepts that are in the book. You want to have the understanding that's in the book that will help you immensely to be able to have uh, an idea of exactly what you're doing. But there are no actual um, templates or guides, examples in the book. So mm -hmm. you want these templates as, a, as an example. But again, like, like uh, Nate said, you do not want to copy them. You want to use them as a reference so that you have an idea of what Amazon's looking for. You have an idea of the general structure. But I'm going to tell you, there might be 20 different ways that you could write a successful plan. And they don't have to look like mine. It's just these are examples of ones that have worked, right? Mm -hmm. And so you, you simply want to follow that general methodology. It's like, you know, you see all people, all kinds of people uh, shooting baskets in basketball differently you know there's a there's a one right way to do it that this is the proper form but then you see people who are just knocking them down like crazy using their own form right but the the general principles often still apply and so you want to you want to have the knowledge base that comes from reading the book right you're only talking about a two or three hour commitment to read the read the entire thing and it's cheap to to you guys it's like it's like 25 30 bucks or something on amazon i've linked it a couple times here in chat but it, it's cheap everyone should be grabbing this book i do recommend the the hard copy unless you just never read a hard, hard copy and you're only going to read it electronically on kindle but i like it because you can mark it up you can tab the pages you can go back and refer to specific things and then that will give you honestly a lot more confidence to be able to write one of these on your own and then once you have the templates in hand it's like, okay, I got a complaint for this specific thing. I'm going to go find the template that corresponds with that. I have an idea of what my starting point will be, and it will save you a lot of time and trouble and, and money, really. Mm -hmm. It's like you you won't have to pay the, the full price to be able to get one of these removed from your account um, when you've already gone and done a lot of the legwork on your own it's totally worthwhile exactly i like comparing this there's this like uh pedagogical theory that like things for teachers learning how to teach where there's sort of like the upper levels like watch me do it do it with me then i watch you do it so the book is sort of like you watch scott you watch how he does it and then if you need a little bit more help if you need some sort of like i need to do this with scott i need to actually like have this done with me that's sort of this template thing like scott has done it you can sort of input your own answers but this is doing it with him and then if you want scott to watch you do it okay he's available for that you can sign up for that for those who need it but those are sort of the, like the three different levels everyone should be up here everyone should at least watch scott do this grab this like 25 dollars book 30 dollars book whatever it is um watch how he writes plan of actions many of you i think is sort of that like do it with me that uh like you're looking for some plan of actions to actually fill in your own things for see exactly what he wrote how he wrote it all of that stuff um and then a few of you if you're like you know i've got the money i don't have the time i need the help yeah hire scott out and and he'll be happy to look at your stuff and fix it up for you i can also review and revise and edit your plan of action and i can also show you the edits that i make if that's important to you you know i can put it into uh you know word or, or docs and and you can see all the comments and all the edits so you can see what was changed and why um, if you're trying to really study what's going on and learn what changes are necessary. Um, mm -hmm. That being said, and if you're struggling and you've submitted a number of times, you just need help tweaking what you've already got, then it may be appropriate just to you know, sign up to get what you've uh, put forth to Amazon already, get it reviewed, revised, and edited. Yep. And if people want to like hire you directly, I mean, we don't even, we're, we're not like affiliating this or anything. If people want to just hire you directly and talk with you, how can they get a hold of you? Uh, Ecom, E C O M is in Mike, seller tools with an S dot com. Seller tools. Let me, boom. Let's see if that stuck. Oh, it didn't stick. No. EcomSellerTools.com. Like that. EcomSellerTools.com. Perfect. Awesome. All right, Scott. 
Thank you so much for joining us this evening. Man, this was, we went a little bit over. I appreciate you giving us some extra time here. Tried to, I told you it would be an hour and here we are, hour and 15 minutes later. We like to talk. <laughs> but Scott, this was fantastic. Um, I'm glad, hopefully this sort of helped both teach people some new things, but also ease some worries. I know there's so many people who are constantly like living in fear. Like, oh, what if I get an IP claim? Oh, I got an IP claim. What do I do? Um, hopefully this can sort of ease some of that stress. Every every problem has a solution on Amazon. Uh, whether that's avoiding IP claims, there's a solution. Whether that's you got one and you want to retract it, there's a solution. Writing a plan of action, there's a solution. Even if you get kicked off Amazon, there's a solution. Um, so know that there's always a solution to your problems. That's that's sort of an overarching, everyone take a breath and understand that. And hopefully you'll be a little bit calmer in the future. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, definitely get the help you need when you need it, right? If you have questions that are not getting answered by the wisdom in the crowd of the crowd in the Facebook group, uh, and you need coaching or consulting, it's important to reach out and get the information you need when you need it. Yep. Yep. So just a reminder, guys, if you go to the link, um, I'll post it here in chat again. So it's actually directly on our website. So hustlebuddiesofficial.com slash, I put it right there, slash account health, and then use the coupon live call 100. It gives you 100 bucks off of all of the templates and plan of actions that Scott has uh, written up previously that he sort of bases his stuff off of. All right. Awesome. Thank you so much, Scott. We will see you later. Thank you so much, Hustle Buddies, for coming out and joining us tonight. We will see you on the next stream. Good night, everyone.